Hello, everybody, and welcome to our live interview with Johanna Rothman. So Johanna has been managing projects and programs since almost longer than I've been alive. Um, she was one of the earliest experimenters of what is now known as agile techniques. And um, she has developed a really unique and real world understanding of how to implement agile in a way that works. She has written several books, including Agile and Lean Program Management, Scaling Collaboration Across the Organization, um, which we highly recommend. In today's talk, um, we're going to focus on the big picture of scaling agile. So first, just a few words about agile methodologies for those of the attendees that are not quite so familiar about it. Um, agile methodologies are based on a set of principles that were laid out in a document called the Manifesto for Agile Software Development, and it was published in 2001. So it's a um, way to manage um, projects uh, that brings a lot more flexibility and feedback uh, into the development process. The general idea is to trust the team members to self-organize into cross-functional teams that work together to deliver, to deliver the value to the organization. So this value um, mostly takes the form of functional features, so features that actually work and that could be re released externally if the company decides to do so. So now the topic of scaling agile. Um, we've been hearing an increasing number of people talking about scaling agile and sometimes with the awe that's usually reserved to the ultimate frontier of the universe. Um, so Johanna, what does actually scaling agile mean? So, for me, it means a whole bunch of things. The first part is you have the ability to take functions, right? You have developers, you have testers, you have UI or UX people, you might have technical writers, you have DBAs, uh, database administrators, you have whatever you need and they create a cross-functional team that delivers features, as you said. The next step for me is about scaling what one team does to this ability to collaborate among several teams so that they can all produce a product together. And this, this is much more difficult than just one team working on, them, on their own. Um, there are several other ways to, uh, to think about scaling Agile. The next part for me is this adaptive planning so that you plan and replan at the project portfolio level to say which project is the most strategic project for us now and at the product level so that you can do more continual planning for the products that have projects in progress and then there's how you scale agile across the organization where you bring in finance and HR and then how managers change how they manage so I've been writing a series of posts on my blog I'm almost ready to publish the management posts today because when you when we were preparing for this I thought you know it would be really nice if I had a bunch of blog posts to point people to so I'm almost done with that series Oh, definitely. I'm sure our attendees will very much appreciate um, to see you sort of in the details. So based on what you say, really Agile can be scaled to different levels of the organization. Does it actually make sense to scale um, Agile and Lean to the whole enterprise? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason, this is, I know all of you are rolling your eyes, it's a typical consultant's answer, it depends. And the real thing that it depends on is how often do you need to change what you're doing. If you don't need to change, if your organization has a very stable product and you have stable customers and there's no innovation that you need, now, no, you don't have to do Agile or Lean. You can do whatever you want as long as you keep getting the same results. When you stop getting the same results, you might need to change something. But the re here's the thing I have seen. It almost does not matter what industry you're in or what organization you're in. The pace of change has changed, right? I started to work back in the 70s, so yes, Alexandra, I did start to manage projects before you were born, and 
<laughs> it, it, you know, what can I say? I, I have earned my gray hair. And I think that the key is everything was slower then. Um, our, we did not have cell phones. We didn't have the internet. And thank goodness that we have them now. But that means that since people have information at their fingertips, what they want to be able to do ha often changes. So almost every industry needs to consider how can I use agile and, uh, and lean um, approaches and ideas to increase our ability to respond to our customers. Will you have to change? Probably not, or not all at once. But should you think about it? Yes, you should think about it. it it's really that, because um, having spoken to quite a lot of our customers, um, they do report this acceleration and um, the need to deal with it in a way that brings value to the company. So that's definitely something I think that will resonate with our attendees. But so coming back to Scaling Agile, um, what actually is it that makes it so difficult uh, to bring this technique to um, the larger organizational group inside? So I think the biggest thing is the cultural change. Yes, everyone, everyone changes what they do and how they do it. So instead of working in functions, we work in cross-functional teams. And the, the issue here is not that it's one cross-functional team that delivers value that we, I think of as the software and the, and the software developers and testers and whomever, is that we have cross-functional teams for the product right, the product manager and the product owners and maybe even customer support saying, here's what we need to do for the product over a period of time. We have a cross-functional team for the project portfolio so that we decide as an organization, how will we implement our strategy? We have cross-functional teams for management. They have to decide how will we um, assess our current financial measures so that we know what to do next. We have cross-functional teams for HR. HR cannot work in its own, um, oh, I'm going to offend people here, bubble. We have to bring HR into what management does. HR cannot tell management what to do, and management cannot tell HR what to do, and that is a cultural change. We are so accustomed to thinking about the hierarchy where we have functions, right? The functions are vertical, and instead, we have to have these cross-cutting teams all over the organization. That's a huge change. It, it makes the culture all different. Well, um, based on our experience with change management, um, actually, it's the most difficult thing to do. And um, from what you're saying, Scaling Agile actually touches something that is a pretty big switch, actually a massive switch for many companies. Um, so why, why would a company want to switch to Agile? What are the main benefits that they would expect to derive from um, such a big leap in culture? So first of all, I would never say to change everything all at once. I, <laughs> I recommend, as I suspect that you folks do, that you take an agile approach to moving to agile. You do a little bit at a time. You experiment, you try something, you gather some data, and then you assess the results and try something else. Or maybe continue with that experiment. So that's the first piece. And the second piece is the value that it brings. One of the most interesting things about um, the way we measure and deliver value now in our organizations is something that we don't actually do. We do not assess the cost of delay. So let me tell, talk a little bit about the cost of delay. Think of a sine wave where you start at the left with a little bit of uh, um, you you grow a little bit and then you have this very rapid growth and then you um, you have this medium thing at the peak and then you tail off growth at the end. That's a typical sine wave and I hope, um, I hope I'm not confusing anybody. That is how we assess sales right now in, for the organization. It does not matter what, what you sell or 
um, what products or services you sell, they start off small, they grow to big, and then they tail off at the end. And when we have a cost of delay, we push out our ability to recognize revenue. Um, so we, we push out from the left to the right, so we have a delay in recognizing revenue. Our revenue tends to be shorter, so the top, instead of getting to the top curve, we don't get that high. And then we, um, the delay, if we, if we delay introducing a product or a service for a month, we take out the maximum sales for a month. And then we tend to have an earlier, um, an earlier end of life for that product. If you start thinking about cost of delay, that starts to change the work that you work on. It changes it at the, law, at the big picture, at the project portfolio picture. It starts to change it at the feature level for teams. Now, all of a sudden, you get to say, what would allow us to deliver value faster? And maybe we start at the team level, because that's often easier, right? You start at the project at the team level and say, if we do this thing, can we recognize revenue faster? Can we reduce waste faster for ourselves? Because that allows us to recognize revenue faster. And I have found that if we start to think about the cost of delay at the project portfolio level and at the program level, then we can say, this is what we need to do at the team level so we have a constant delivery of value. And now this is a lot harder in, in products with hardware. Right, mechanical or hardware, any of that stuff, there's, um, you cannot be totally agile because there's phases at the beginning where you have to do some setup. You might iterate and increment through the project, and then you have phases at the end because you're not going to replace hardware on a regular basis. But you can do this if you think about what would, al what would allow us to deliver value earlier. And that, that starts to change how everybody thinks, and that starts to change the culture of the organization. It seems to me that that would be a pretty weighty argument to try to sell Agile um, and scale Agile to the higher-ups. Um, what would you say? So somebody would like to try that. Um, how should they present it to their hierarchy? So this is... Um, this is where they say it might be useful to think about cost of delay um, divided by duration. And this is, this is one of those tricky things. This requires a little bit of prediction. What do we think this, this feature or this project is worth to us? And even if you say um, we're going to pick a number out of the air, we think this feature is worth, and I'm going to use dollars because I'm not, I'm not very good at using any other currency because I'm in the U.S., right, of course. Um, if we think this feature is worth $10,000 and it's going to take us two weeks to deliver it, that means that the cost of delay um, is going to be $5,000 a week. So if we, don't, if we get it out in the next two weeks, we have no cost of delay. But if we actually delay longer, our costs go up. Now let's compare that to a feature that is worth $100,000, but we think it's going to take eight weeks. No, let me do four weeks because I can actually do that. So we have, we, I don't do arithmetic very well. I do math extremely well. So, so, so we have $10,000 over two weeks and $100,000 over four weeks. Which one is the most valuable? The $100,000 over four weeks. Now, if you ask me, I'm going to say, what is the first piece of value that we can get out so we don't have to wait for the four weeks and we can recognize some of that revenue earlier? And that's, that's one way of using cost of delay. Now, that is very different from saying, here's the estimate for this project. Right? So the, the estimate is, we think it's going to take four weeks. And we think this other thing is going to take two weeks. So if you only look at the estimates, you might say, you know, I don't know. We can get something out, out after two weeks from this smaller thing. 
But if we look at the value, this this changing of ideas from estimate of time and cost to the value of the time and cost. And then if you're like me, you say, let's not wait for four weeks. Now you have something that allows you to proceed in a way that provides more value to the organization faster. And that's, I have had um, mixed results bringing that to higher ups because they're so accustomed to thinking about estimates of time and scope because that's all we had in Waterfall. That's really all we had. We could not see value earlier. But now that we can see value earlier, we have other options to discuss what value is. This aspect of um, taking into account value and always asking the question, what's the first thing that I can do that will bring the most value, is also a pretty big leap um, in the mindset of people that are doing Agile. Um, what would you recommend as um, techniques or approaches to sort of further develop uh, this Agile and Lean frame of mind? So I always suggest to teams that they start with themselves. I mean, I actually suggest with people that they start with themselves, right? Each individual person can say, it's not so much about what I do, how can I help this team deliver value? And what is the smallest thing that we can do to deliver value today? So I often encounter architects who say, I need three months to work on the architecture for this product. And I can say, I bet it will take three months if you add it up all together. But how do you know that you'll be right? And they look at me and they say, I'm really smart. I've done this before. And, and I look at them and I say, and how many times have you been wrong partway through the project? And they say, sometimes, because they can't <laughs> say always. They can say sometimes. So what I say is, instead of taking that three months at the beginning, why don't you do the smallest possible thing that is not architecturally sound, that is that uses a flat file instead of a database, that might not even use the entire product architecture, but you treat as an experiment. What is the first thing you could get out tomorrow that would give you data about what the architecture should be? And when, when they say stuff like that, when I say stuff like that to them, they often say, um, oh, if I can use a flat file, I don't have to have a schema? I say yes. Um, I don't have to worry about performance right now. I say no, but you might want to do a feature that gives you data about performance. Oh, I don't have to have all the nodes. I don't have to scale to 100,000 users. I say no. What if you had 10 users? What kind of, what piece of value could you deliver tomorrow that would allow you to do this now? And they say, oh. I got to go to my computer. I got to write some code. And when they say I got to write some code, I do this little happy dance. And then I then I'm totally obnoxious. Then I say, "Can you write the code with other people?" "Oh, sure. Let me tell them what they need to do." Okay, so the let me tell them what they need to do part, I might work with them there and I might not. I might wait till the next time. But that's how when you free people from the constraints of, I have to do it right the first time, to I have to, and you change that to, I have to experiment right the first time, that allows them to do totally different things. And I find, and then when we look at it, um, when we retrospect at the end of the project, yeah, they spent three months working on the architecture, but they didn't do it all up front. They did it during the project, and they were able to make changes. And did we have to? Did we take a wrong turn and have to back up? Absolutely, we do that. And but our wrong turns are not very large, and our backups are not very large. So we're able to get back on track much, much easily. This because this is a very personal approach in a sense because you're helping uh, people come up with solutions to them to finding the smallest part of value that they can do and um, 
I remember in your book you mentioned that um, it's also a very good approach for helping agile lean teams working with um, other teams that are not necessarily agile. Um, can you tell us a bit more sort of things that can be useful that can help um, sort of interface between these two ways of working? Absolutely. So one of the things I really love is the ability for a program, especially where you have multiple teams, to deliver internally at least once a month. Now, some of you on this podcast are saying, oh, I got you beat. We deliver internally and externally much more often than once a month. But I have found that with waterfall teams, especially people who are tightly wedded to waterfall, they have a really hard time delivering in that short a period of time. So what I say to these program managers, I say, set deliverable-based milestones as often as you can. Once a month is good. If you can only start with two months, start with two months. See if you can bring it back down to once a month. And then say to the waterfall teams, or at least the non-agile teams, um, I don't care how you work inside your team. I care about your delivery, and we, we need your delivery for this program in the next month. So however you do it internally, that's fine. But remember, we only need this much, and I hold my hands together to show that it's a small thing, and you need to deliver it as a fully tested piece of functionality. So if you do, if you want to do all of your um, all of your work by waterfall, that's totally fine. But keep your functional specs small, keep your architecture specs small, keep all your specs small, and then get right into coding and testing. So what I, I'm kind of cheating. I'm actually, I'm actually suggesting that they work in a staged delivery life cycle, which is an incremental life cycle, not iterative and incremental. But it's a very easy transition from waterfall teams because if they do a bunch of specking and and writing of specs and stuff up front, they're much more able to say, oh. Okay, if she, you know, that crazy woman over there, she wants us to deliver just these features uh, for May or for June, I can do that. I will, I'll just deliver these, this stuff by, by the, by the end of this um, next month. I don't call them months iteration. I don't call them sprints. I call them a deliverable based milestone because that's what it is. And when you talk about milestones with non-agile teams, that's a word that, make sense to them and so they have a little comfort there so um, I, I guess I kind of speak in their language so that they are able to to deliver what I need them to deliver inside the program so throughout these this the beginning of this interview uh, you've mentioned a few sort of core principles um, starting small um, feedback, seeking feedback, and um, uh, looking at the value. Um, can we say now that these principles have gotten to a level of maturity that scaling agile has become mainstream? Um, your book was published um, last year in 2016. So um, said differently, can we say that the topic of, stage, uh, of scaling agile has reached an obvious state where we can start to see a body of best practices develop? Oh, I wish we could. <laughs> I I don't think so. I think that since everyone does their own version of Agile and Lean, there's no best practices yet. I think that you you can say that there are principles, right? The the small value, the small deliveries, the working by value. We have not yet talked about managing WIP work in progress, that's WIP, but yes, I mean, all of those principles apply, but I don't know that there are any best practices. I don't know that there, um, that people need a cadence for their program versus an iteration for their program. I don't know if the entire program can work in flow, which is Kanban boards everywhere, or if you need some iterations and time boxes. So. For me, best practices are um, an oxymoron. I, I understand that many practices can work, 
and I do not yet see that there are any best practices that we could always apply and everyone would get the same results. I think we are still in creating our state of the art around scaling Agile, especially to programs, and certainly um, any anything more than that. So this is actually quite a strong contrast to some um sort of ways of explaining uh, scaling agile that we hear uh, in particular um, there are some frameworks that um, have are starting to get some traction um, such as um, the scale agile framework also known as safe uh, you've got the scrum scrums um, did or less um, what's your opinion on these frameworks because some of them like safe are very prescriptive about what you should be doing some of them are a bit more flexible um, so what's your opinion are there any clear winners today, a framework that gives better results? I hope not. Um, <laughs> so when you and I spoke in, in preparation for this, I said, I, I do not believe in any of the frameworks. I do believe that you should look at them and read about them, although I, I have such a problem with SAFE. To me, SAFE to, conflates a number of, of separate issues. So SAFE has this issue of the project portfolio and the product roadmaps, and they talk about it in the same way. And for me, the product roadmap is about this project at this time or program, and the project portfolio implements a strategy for the organization. So it's many projects. So I think that that part is just maybe I am too stupid to understand SAFE. But I'm a pretty smart person. I've been working in this industry for a long time. So if I'm too stupid to understand it, um, I don't know. But even if you find that as a starting point, my, my experience is that planning only on a quarter boundary is, first of all, very expensive and insufficient planning. I do not know of a project or a program that stays still for that long, for the plans to be valid for an entire quarter. And I'm, it sounds like I'm picking on SAFE, and I, I, I can pick on any of the frameworks equally. So they all have this notion of iterations, and I find that the more you think about scaling Agile to the rest of the organization past one team, the less you can think about iteration-based Agile. You can think about a cadence of planning, but the idea of things staying put for an entire iteration, that just does not seem to work. It doesn't work for any of the management teams I know. It doesn't seem to work for the project portfolio teams. It doesn't seem to work for the program management teams. Um, I, I worry about being wedded to such a prescriptive approach. And the problem I see with Scrum of Scrums is that Scrum, if you do a Scrum, right, a stand-up meeting, is all about recommitment from the team members and asking how we can move things to done ourselves. And the problem when you have not quite interdependent work, once you move above the team, you can't see my, my hands, but I have, I have the circle for the team in my hands and then I go above and above and above. Um, the more you move above a team, the less often you have people who can work together for their work. They have to provide independent work back to the program, independent work back to the project portfolio team, independent work back to the product management, uh, the product owner value team. So when you start to think about independent work, why would you have a stand-up? It does not make sense. Because the people on that team, while they are cross-functional, do not actually work together on the deliverables. Their independent work contributes to their deliverables. So I I really worry about this, and, and stand-ups are horrible for problem solving. So use a problem-solving approach for problem-solving. I mean, you might use Lane Coffee. You might use any other kind of problem-solving meeting. But thinking about what you, what you do as a stand-up, hmm, I, I have trouble with that. 
So can you tell us a bit more about these problem solving tools and meetings? Because I think that's something that is of particular interest to our, our attendees. Oh, so I have, I back when I started to run programs, I had um, a problem of the week. So we would have a weekly meeting that I time boxed to one hour. I asked people to send in their problems that we needed to solve at the program level. And what I said to them is, send me all your all your problems, right? And if I cannot help you address them, because you know I have the bandwidth to help you address them, then we will put them in for our problem of the week. Um, I I've, I've been using this technique for a long time, and it still works because we we might do a little bit of check on the milestones at the beginning where are we in the program and then we go to the problem of the week and we do problem solving so um, I don't know if you're familiar with Sam Kainer's work about how groups work in meetings but there's the we explore around the problem that's the divergent ideas and then we converge on a solution so you can do this with several problems in a in a one hour weekly meeting and then you have action items. If you don't have action items at the end of that meeting, you do not have a useful meeting. Right? A meeting always a useful meeting starts with an agenda and action items. Now uh, it ends with action items. Now the interesting thing is that Lean Coffee also allows you to do this. You can then generate the list of issues to address in the meeting, the, that allows you to create the agenda for the meeting in the meeting. You um, discuss each of those issues in a time box way. I like eight minutes a, a, as a time box. And then you have a final time box at the end to collect your action items and make sure that people know what they're supposed to do. Any, any kind of meeting you do that has an agenda at the beginning, whether you start it, whether you send it out in advance or you generate it at the meeting and ends with action items and you have resolution to things and you have action items, that's a great meeting because that means you're making progress on these problems. So I really like a problem solving meeting for whatever kinds of problems we need to solve in the program or wherever it is we are working in the organization. That's a great technique. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. I'd just like to take um, a chance here and, and go back to something you mentioned early on um, about how Agile can't be implemented quite the same way when you're working with physical or hardware products. Um, so I was wondering if you, you mentioned that it was particularly difficult, if you could tell us a bit more about the challenges of doing that and how you could approach it in such a way as to make Agile work uh, when you've got um, hardware or physical aspect to the product that you're managing. So here's what I do. I ask the hardware people to generate their list of constraints and often the list of constraints is footprint or heat or you know heat dissipation or um, something like that. It's, it's almost always related to the physical product and I ask them to generate those constraints at the beginning. Note I did not say generate the architecture to manage those constraints. I asked them to explain what those constraints are. And then there's a technique known as landing zones. I believe that Eric Simmons from Intel um, wrote the first paper about it and I have it referenced in the book. And that says we need heat dissipation, for example, is always inside a plus or minus. And footprint, it might be a very small plus or minus, but it's always a plus or minus. So where do we land? How do we, how do we negotiate heat dissipation inside of this footprint? Maybe there's a power thing also. And that you, you might not be able to create release criteria, but you keep them in mind. When you define the constraints at the beginning and then you say, please iterate on the design, because hardware looks a lot like software and so does mechanical, you can, you can iterate on the designs and simulate your way through these constraints. And the really nice thing about the simulations is you can show people the simulations just like a demo. So you can iterate and it will look 
it looks a little bit different than Agile for a software team because you're not producing final product, but you're, do, you're producing demoable product as you go. And then when you're ready to go to a prototype, because I my my idea of, of hardware and mechanical is you always do prototypes and then you do pilots and then you finally have production. So when you have a prototype, you're ready to marry any software with the hardware because there's almost always firmware or software or something involved in this, even if it's just a boot ROM. So um, the, a way to boot things. So you marry the software people have been demoing all along. They've been simulating. They may even have a hardware simulator. And then you can start to marry everything once you have a prototype. Now, when you have a prototype, you again iterate through what you have to do for the hardware and mechanical stuff and the software. It turns out that a lot of this iteration um, is a lot of back and forth. My experience with hardware is that I, I love you hardware people, but my experience is that hardware always thinks they can do a lot more than they actually can because they're almost always pushing the bounds of physics and the software people have to come in and um, kind of um, use the broom behind them. So the hardware people did not quite get to what they wanted to do, but we can do that in software instead. And that's what the prototype and pilot time of the project is. But here's the cool thing. If everyone iterates a lot during the iteration stuff, then by the time you have a prototype, you have not that much more time before you go into a pilot, which allows you to um, keep your pilot time short, which allows you to, to get to production much earlier. Okay, that, that definitely makes sense. Um, so that would be also a way to manage uh, the cost of the prototypes and the overhead that can come with small iterations because um, then you'd wait to almost the last moment before actually producing the prototype. Exactly. And the fact that you have short iterations and short and small demos means that people get the feedback a lot faster. So. Mm -hmm. I want the feedback in the hardware, I want the feedback in the software, and I want to, and if they look at each other's demos, now they can say, oh, I didn't know you could do that. So, and that's from both sides. So that allows them to collaborate on what the hardware ha could be. Definitely. Um, so I had well, just one last set of questions really about, um, in your book, you mentioned that a uh, program sh should increasingly think of itself um, in terms of a product, and that's a trend that we've um, seen with our customers. Um, actually, in one of our recent interviews um, with a customer in the aerospace and defense industry, uh, they were talking about how they were increasingly using uh, this product as a means to um, give some meaning uh, to their program. Can you Remind us about uh, of the interest and benefits of um, seeing products instead of a program. Sure. So when you think about a, at least when I, I'm going to talk about me. Okay. I can't. I'm not mind reading. I'm not talking about any of you. But I find that for me, when I think about a product, I think about why we are delivering this product and who our customers are. That that feels different for me than thinking about a project or a program. And I know it's a little bit, you know, some of you are probably shaking your head, oh, it's that Johanna, she's being wacko again. But I find that when we, when we think about the product, we think about the entire product. We think about what do we need to do to bring this product to market. We stop thinking about, um, it's just software, and I don't care what the marketing people have to do. So as a software developer, I might not think about what the marketing people have to do, but when I see something on the board that says generate performance data for marketing communications, I say, oh, I have a product. It's not just about my software development. I need to talk to my Agile project manager or my program manager and talk about 
what do I need to do to make sure I deliver this this information to the marketing communications people so we have an entire product and I find that that helps us optimize up a level right so we are we're all about optimizing at the team level, and what, especially for a program, we want to optimize at the product level. So once we get the team working together so that the team delivers features, the team needs to also be able to look up a level and say, does, does a program need anything else from us so we can deliver a wonderful product? So. In your experience, um, how good are companies at seeing that, at zooming out, in a sense, to uh, the entirety of the product? So the more functionally organized an, an, uh, an, an entire organization is, the harder it seems to be to do this. And this is, that's because the rewards reinforce the functional silos. Once you start to be more cross-functional, and that's, I'm not saying you reorganize your entire organization, don't do that. But when the rewards start to be cross-functional, then people say, oh, I should look at the entire product. So we want people to deliver products. Um, we've talked about um, incenting people for project completion, which I think is kind of not so hot. Um, Maybe not totally crazy, but not not such a good idea. But if we talk about, are we able to recognize product completion? Because that might be more than just a project. Now, all of a sudden, we can recognize revenue faster. So how do we get the entire organization thinking about the products and services we provide as opposed to my job? Right. So. This goes back to seeing the whole, which is one of the lean principles. And, uh, you know, and for me, it's all tied together. I really want people to be able to say, how can we, how can we create great experiences for our customers, whether those experiences are hardware or software products or some other service? How do we create that entire product so that we are able to satisfy and make our customers happy. I, can you give us an example of what a cross-functional benefit would look like? So one of the things I've seen is that um, people, um, okay, let me tell you a story and I hope that we stay in our time. <laughs> um, so I was a project manager a long time ago and my manager said to me, I'll give you a bonus if you deliver this project on this date. And I said, sure, I can deliver it today if you don't care about the entire product. And he looked at me and said, are you giving me SAS? Um, I said, no, um, I'm not. I'm not trying to give you SAS, um, but here's the key. I don't have any control over marketing communications. So I can finish this project when you say, and that's still not going to give you the revenue because you're not thinking about the product. So you can, and it does not make sense to incent me because I have an entire team, right? So this is before mm -hmm. I knew about Agile and Lean. Um, we, can, we can do anything you want. I don't know about making this particular date, but we can have something to deliver by that date, but I cannot bring in all those other people I need to bring in. So until you, if you tell me what you want, do you want to deliver this product by this date or do you want me to finish this project by this date? And he, he sat back and looked at me and said, I'll get back to you. Because he really did not know what he wanted. So this is, uh, I've been a big fan of paying teams for teamwork, right? So if you, I'm not big on bonuses. I realize everyone loves their bonuses. I think, I, I, I think you should pay people a reasonable salary and then work by product. Because um, individual work, in any, in knowledge work, individual work is not quite material. 
especially if you're moving to Agile. The more people collaborate, the better the product is, the faster it gets out. Why would you incent them on individual work? So I worked with another team where we actually made this amazing deliverable. And um, the manager said to me, this is back when $10,000 meant something. He said, I'm giving, since you brought in this project on time, I'm giving you a $10,000, um, and $10,000 was a big, a lot of money back then, um, uh, bonus. And I said, well, it can't just be for me, it has to be for the team. So I'm going to, I'm going to tell the team, here's the money, and you guys decide what to do with it. I was wondering, am I doing the right thing? Am I going to create a series of monsters? So I said to the, I mean, I said to the team, here, you have $10,000. It's not really mine. I facilitated you. You guys did all the work. So they said, as like one person, they turned to the technical writer and said, she should get 40%. She should get the most of it, and the rest of us will split the rest. And I looked at them, and I said, why don't you do this by, um, by individual vote? Write on the sticky what you think everyone should get, because, you know, I'm a little nervous about this. So one, one person said I should get 1000 bucks, which I thought was very <laughs> nice. And, and all the rest of them said 40% for this technical writer, and then the rest divided up evenly among the team, and of course, nothing for me. So, <laughs> and, and that was fine, because they had decided it among themselves. So I think that I said, when I read this stuff, I said, thank you for the vote of confidence. I will pass on this. I will make sure none of the money comes through my account. I will make sure that the company pays you directly, because otherwise I have to get taxes. This is horrible. So, and they decided, right? And, and it was not, I think it took them 20 seconds to decide, even when I asked them to write it up in in, in a card, right? Uh, I don't know if I used stickers or cards back then. But, I mean, they decided what to do. So cross-functional teams that work together understand who contributes what. Mm -hmm. Managers do not understand. So let's get the managers out of the equation and give the power to the teams. Now, this does not work if you have one person driving and controlling the team. It does not. This has to be a cross-functional team that is self-managing. Well, I think this makes the perfect conclusion to um, our live talk today. Um, I'm being signaled that we're a little bit over time, so um, it's time to wrap up. Thank you very much, for Joanna, for um, sharing your insights and experience about stay, uh, scaling Agile with us. Um, as a reminder, Joanna wrote last year a great book about the reality of Agile and Lean Program Management. It's called Agile and Lean Program Management Scaling Collaboration Across the Organization. And we recommend um, you read it if you're looking to add some form of agility to your program development. We hope you enjoyed this interview and look forward to seeing you all again in another one of the events. So I wish you all a great day and thank you again, Joanna, for your time. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.